So in February, I did a little survey about questions and worries and dreams, and I collected a few things and ideas from church people just like you. And, and so one of the questions that came up that someone asked was, is child training brainwashing? So we want to deal with that question today. And also another question was, uh, a worry actually appeared several times, is the, what about my adult children who seem to be going astray? And so the text today uh, can bring uh, some answers to both of those, those concerns. I want to begin by um, telling you a story about a, the funeral I did last week. Um, and I met, by surprise, a young man who I didn't even know knew, knew this woman. Uh, and I was there in the foyer right before the funeral started, and here he comes walking in. I said, whoa, I hadn't seen him in like five years, and so we embraced, and, and in just a couple minutes, I learned he was married, he's got a two-year-old girl, and uh, he's got a business going, and um, he's an avid fisherman, I remember, because he used to fish with my son. And, and he says, my two-year-old girl, she knows how to fish already. She knows how to catch a fish already at two. And he's an avid snowboarder. He says, I taught her how to snowboard at a year and a half. <laughs> I go, whoa, this dad's getting after it right away when it comes to teaching his own child. Well, the Bible affirms the, the fact that parents are the primary teachers and trainers of their children and that this training begins at birth and continues throughout childhood. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. This is Proverbs 1.8. The whole book of Proverbs was written to young people. Listen, children, sons, and daughters, to your father and your mother. Then our text for the day. Train a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Proverbs 22.6. Many parents have that underlined in their Bible. And then Deuteronomy 6, which we referred to last Sunday. These commandments that I give to you are today are to be upon your heart. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. I've done some study on that in the past. And that word impress, the word underlined impress, literally is a very strong word. It literally means to leave a mark. Like a 40-ton tank leaves a mark in soft soil, leave a mark like that on your children. Impress upon them these things whenever you can. So verbal instruction, your visible example, your constant reputation, your appropriate discipline, a parent is to teach their children everything that they know. Yes, how to fish how to snowboard, but also how to know and love God. We live in a world that values training. We train horses. I taped California Chrome's win yesterday. <laughs> I had to see that. We train horses for speed and agility. We train dogs for hunting and for show. We train athletes. We train employees. We train musicians. We train our military. Some of us even train plants. <laughs> Right? <laughs> and I train church members. That's what the boot camp is all about. It's a training course. If you haven't been through it, you need to go through it. You're an untrained church member. And if you haven't gone through the boot camp, that's my plug. <laughs> so why should we, why would we not then? If we train everything else and everyone else, why would we not take training of children seriously? Last week, before Mother's Day, there was this great quote by uh, the, uh, uh, Kevin Durant, the NBA Most Valuable Player. And I don't know if the clip is available or not. Is it available? Okay, give it a try. And uh, we actually downloaded it, see if we can actually play it for you this Sunday, about what he said about his mother. It's not going to work. So I'll tell you what he said about his mother. <laughs> he said that, that, that she is the most valuable player. And he talked about how she made him and his brother get up early and run and, and, and insisted that they stay away from the streets and devoted their lives into to the sporting world. And, and look where he is today. And he says it was because, Mom, it's what you did for us. Not only did you feed us and you clothed us, but you 
you narrowed our way. You helped us focus. And that's what the word train actually means. It means to narrow. It means to narrow. Uh, not in the negative sense, but in the positive sense of helping a child focus to stay away from that and to focus here. And then training takes place. Uh, if you've ever been on sports teams, the coach can be really tough on you folks. You can't do this and this and this before the game. You can't eat this and this and that before the game, right? They have, they have narrowing kind of parameters in order for you to do your best out there on the field or in the pool or wherever it might be. So her training, her discipline paid off in a big way. She was the most valuable player, he says to her. It's a beautiful quote. I, you know, go on YouTube and look it up. It's, it's a wonderful thing that he said about his mom there. Um, the Bible says to parents who seem to be reluctant or somehow too busy to train their children, uh, correction imparts wisdom, but a child left to himself without training will disgrace his mother. Discipline your son and he will give you peace. He will bring delight to your soul. And so if you don't, then you will have what? Grief and disappointment. So the first point in the text is to train. Train, train, train your children. And that's what our text says. Train a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not turn from it. So I want to look at that verse phrase by phrase today. Uh, as, As we talk about the importance of training... Before I get started on that verse, there are those who believe in child training. But when it comes to spirituality and the principles of religion, they, they believe that at that point you should leave your child alone to choose when they get older those religious beliefs which appear to be most reasonable to them. They say that such parental training in the area of spirituality is, is, is brainwashing, is biasing a youthful mind. Now, what is brainwashing? According to Webster's Dictionary, it is forced indoctrination to induce someone to give up basic political, social, or religious beliefs and to accept contrasting regimented ideas. That's the legal or the, or the Webster's definition of it, you know, forced indoctrination You have a set of beliefs, now I'm going to force you to change your beliefs to this. I don't think that's when we talk about child training. But professor of systematic theology, Paul Jewett, who I had the privilege of having classes with, said this, are we not to teach our children anything? But if we begin to teach, where will we stop? Shall we teach them about the birds and the bees and leave them to themselves to discover heaven and hell? Shall we give our children information about every other subject and leave out the most important of all subjects, the subject of religion, the knowledge of God, and our duty to Him? Indeed. Why is it that we would teach our children all of these, but say, no, when it comes to spiritual things and religion, well, we've got to let them decide. Things happen when you start teaching children spiritual truth, they come home with questions that you can't ask. <laughs> you can't answer, I should say. It happens at Wonderland all the time. I hear it from the teachers. They will, those kids will hear a story. They'll hear a biblical concept at school, and then they'll go home, and they'll talk to their parents, and their parents, oh, I can't answer that. <laughs> and that's true. Our kids can an- ask questions that we can't answer or we find very difficult to answer. But... You know, when your child pitches you a curveball, do you step out of the batter's box and just let it go by? No, you stay in and you take a swing. Come on, you know. (laughs) That's what parenting is about. Don't step out of the batter's box. When your child asks you difficult questions, well, then that's your cue to, to improve your learning, you know. Get some books out. Go talk to somebody and, and get an intelligent answer to give to your child. Don't just say, well, I'll talk to you tomorrow about it and then never do it. Come on. You're abdicating your God-given responsibility as parents. Uh, Don't give the subject of spirituality away to others. I will tell you, we have children's ministry here. Yes, if I bring my child to Sunday school, they will learn something. Yes. 
But do not believe the myth that Sunday school is enough. It's not enough. I'll be the first one to tell you. 45 minutes once a week, and again, you all don't come every Sunday, right? <laughs> right? Most people do not come to church every single Sunday. So how much spiritual training is your child actually getting in and through the church? Precious little. Not enough. So parents, you've got to do it. We, we want to support you, but we cannot, we will not, we should not replace you when it comes to spiritual training of your children. You must take the spiritual training of your ser- uh, children seriously. And if you're teaching them to pray and reading the Bible stories throughout the week, that is your job. What we do on Sunday is just augmentation, support, not replacement. Please, please do not abdicate that to other people. So, again, the, it says train. Train them in all subjects, including spiritual subjects. When they're children, the word child literally means to tumble, to toss up and down, and it refers to the period between infancy and adolescence. When a child is full of volume and full of energy, wants to play and jump around, it's when their young minds are like sponges and Man, they are so quick to learn and so eager to learn. And you can give them information that they'll never forget at that young age. They are in, in, in able to memorize incredible amounts of information if you will give them information. But the word child also tells me that our time of training is limited. It's limited. It's during childhood that you have the greatest influence upon your children. Have you ever heard the phrase, children are wet cement? Yeah, they get hard after a while. And after 13, it's, they're even harder. <laughs> so, so when you say train your child, you know, the, 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 the training began at birth with the Jewish father. When the baby was born, the first words they would speak into the child's ear is, the Lord is God. So right away, spiritual training began in the Jewish home. So let's follow that and realize that the older your children get, the less influence you will have because they are wet cement. Think of that. You do not have an unlimited time, so you dare not waste a day or an opportunity. You know, I'm waiting for the teachable moment. Well, the Scripture says they're all around you. They're at bedtime. They're at daytime. They're at mealtime. They're at work time. Just look. These are opportunities to teach your children. So take advantage of them because you don't have an unlimited time to train your child. It's during their childhood that you have the greatest influence. Train a child now in the way he should go. What way is that? In the way he should go. So there are two major interpretations about this phrase. Both of them have merit and meaning. So what is the way he should go? Well, let's example uh, Prince George from England, right? He was in Australia and he was in the news every, every day showing how this little guy was playing with his others. Now, this little guy, what, is he 18 months old? Not even that. Uh, He doesn't know he's from royalty, and yet he one day will be the king of England if everything goes well. His father, those boys have no choice as to the way that they will go, right? They're born into royalty. From day one, they are being groomed for royal leadership. And there are those who believe that the book of Proverbs is such a book of training for royalty. That King Solomon wrote this so that it could be used to teach those who are being groomed for royal service. Young men, primarily in that culture. And so there was a very specific way of life they wanted to train these young men and boys in. It was specifically the way of wisdom. We want to Have these boys go in the way of wisdom, not the way of foolishness. We want them to go the way of life, not the way of death. We want them to go the way of the Lord, not the way of sinners. We want them to go the way of the good, not the way of the wicked. We want them to go to the way of the upright, not the way of the slothful. So you'll see throughout Proverbs the contrast. There's this way, and then there's that way. And we want you to go the way of wisdom. We want you to go the way of the the Lord, the way that is good and upright. And so paths were presented. This is not brainwashing. Options were presented. 
the consequences and the benefits were displayed. The child learned, if you do this, this will happen. If you do that, this will happen. And so the child is not being forcibly into one particular way. He is being presented with options. But the whole purpose was that the child would embrace the way of wisdom and avoid the pitfalls of the way of folly, wickedness, and death. So that's one interpretation, that the way is the way of the Lord, the way of wisdom, and I would embrace that. But on the other hand, there are those who say this phrase also means something else, and illustrated by this young girl who was on TV just last week. This young girl up behind me invented a flashlight that doesn't need batteries. Did you see this story? It's It energizes the light by the warmth from your own hand. Now, that's ingenious. That's ingenious. What is she, 12 years old? She got the Google Science Award, and so they interviewed her family. And her father and mother said when she was little, we noticed that this girl had lots of curiosity, and she took everything apart. And the father says, I was like that, but when I took things apart, I got punished for it. But he says, I'm going to do different. I see this innate curiosity. I, th- I see this ability to take things apart. So he built her a workshop, gave her tools, and shut off the TV and let her curiosity work. And look what has happened. Here she's 12, and she's inventing stuff. You know? And he said, we shut off the TV. We built her a workbench. We saw in her this God-given curiosity, this interest, this talent, And we said, let's encourage that, which God already put in her. And look what happened. See, in the way he or she should go may also mean that the parents need to be students of their own child. Where they are careful then to observe that child's unique personality, their talents, and their interests. And then to set up those environments for learning that fit that child's God-given bent or gifting. They love math, then then encourage that and and teach all the other subjects through that interest. You know, it can be done. It's a beautiful thing when you can do that. So train up a child in the way, in the way of wisdom, indeed, but also in the way that God uniquely shaped them and put them together. Also, very equally important. So is the, the question, is child training brainwashing? I would say no. Uh, the Bible supports clearly that the parent is the primary teacher in the training of their children. It is their fiduciary responsibility to educate and to train their children in all things and especially in the areas of spirituality and religion. Now, before I leave that, there's some political things that are taking place that I want to caution you about as parents. And I've been apprised of these because Carrie Powers, our director, went to a conference and she went to a legislative briefing on laws that are currently in the pipeline that have a certain definite impact on our school. So we have to be interested in what's happening. And so one of the the laws that is coming down the pike is Senate Bill 837, the Kindergarten Readiness Act. And again, I understand uh, the politics of these things. Uh, I am not endorsing or necessarily uh, unendorsing these things because they are a law in the pipeline. It's not law. And I understand that these are made primarily with the um, disenfranchised child in mind. Um, But if this law passes, it will effectively move the mandatory age for public education from six to four. So you will have four-year-olds in public school if this passes uh, as a way of preparing them for kindergarten. Now, I can tell you right now that will have a negative financial impact on any private preschool. That will definitely do that. But even more concerning is another voice that is authored Senate Bill 1123, which, and I quote, which will seek to establish comprehensive evidence-based locally controlled programs for for children birth to three. 
So I get concerned about that. Yes, again, for the, uh, I don't know what to say, the disenfranchised, the underprivileged child, they see that these children aren't getting what they need in these first five years of life, and so we want to offer those programs uh, to, to all children, but particularly that group of, of children. But beyond that, I, I get the sense then that there are those who want to take the res responsibility of training away from the parent. Say, you guys aren't doing a good job, so we want to do it for you. Let the state train your children. And that's what I caution you about. That's what I caution you. Do you really want the state training your child in the areas of spirituality? Do you? From birth to three and then four to six? This is just a caution to think about that, that there may be something a little more uh, uh, under the agenda than just the words that are there. Because I still think, regardless of what the state may provide, that it is still our responsibility to train our children. Now, for the remaining minutes, let me speak to you about wayward children, because this verse also speaks about that. Train a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. My wife and I enjoy watching this television program. It's 19 and counting. It's the story of this family, conservative Christian couple, the Duggars, who have 19 children, all homeschooled children. And uh, they, I'm sure, believe that this verse will come true for all 19 of their children. And I hope they're right. So far, uh, their oldest son got married and left the nest, and he seems to be following in the footsteps of his parents. But now there's a host of other children that are coming, like one right after the other. And they're going to come to that age where they, too, will want to be leaving the nest. And the question is, will they follow the pattern that their parents have taught them all of those, those years. In my personal experience as a pastor, one of the heaviest burdens that Christian parents bear is that when this verse doesn't seem to be coming true for their children. And I've done surveys, and, and that continues to be one of the sources of real pain in Christian parents' lives. They have done what they thought they were supposed to do, and yet their child has rejected their value system and the faith and is now wayward. And a couple of years ago, I think it's been three years ago, I did a whole series of messages on wayward children. There's four sermons in that. If you want to find that, I, I can get that for you probably. But where I dealt with this in more depth, each because children go wayward in lots of ways, not just spiritual ways. But what does this mean? When he is old, he will not turn from it. Uh, first, the word old means, um, the root word is beard. So, so, so an old person is somebody who is mature enough to have a little beard. And so these children are, again, what? Beyond adolescence. Uh, they are grown. And so these men are old right up here. Okay? They, <laughs> But they still act like adolescents. <laughs> so, just to give us a little humor there. So, we're talking about children who are grown, who are beyond adolescence. What can parents do when a, an adult child turns aside from their childhood training? Again, this verse is not an ironclad promise, it's a proverb. It's a proverb. It's not an unconditional guarantee that if you train your child X, Y, Z, that they will X, Y, Z the rest of their life. My experience doesn't bear that out. It just doesn't. So what happens when you have an adult child? Now you have, once they're turning 18 legally, boy, you, you're, you're, you have a lot less influence legally and emotionally. So here's what can you do. Just Again, I have more information on this than I can give you today. But I think the place to start is simply to admit your shortcomings and confess your sins against your child. Two weeks ago, I was at a conference. We listened to uh, Dan Allender, who's a professional therapist. His specialty is in trauma and abuse uh, as, as, a, as a therapist. 
And he talked to us pastors about 1 Timothy 1, where Paul the apostle says, I am the chief of sinners. Paul the apostle says, I'm the chief of sinners. And he says, pastors, never, never forget that, that you too are a sinner. You are fallen. So there are no perfect pastors and there are no perfect parents. The best Christian parents, even the Duggars, you know, you know, are fallen and they sin against their own children in the process of upbringing. So it's time to have a conversation with your adult child and review the history and say, what is it? Is there anything that you know that I did that harmed you as a child? And start there by coming clean and asking them to forgive you. This speaker told us that his own son, I mean, he's an academic guy. He has multiple degrees. He loves college. I mean, he has raised his kids to go to college and graduate school, you know. So his son comes to him two years into college and says, Dad, I'm dropping out of college because I want to be a welder. And immediately out of his mouth, he said, then all financial money is cut off from you right now. And he said, I sinned against my son right then, right then. And I'm a Christian and I write all these books and all that. But in that moment, he regrets those words because his flesh came out. His son was not following the way. He's going to be a welder instead of some guy like he is. And he said, we're cutting you off financially. And the son said, fine, I can do it on my own. And he did. So he had to go back and apologize for those words later. It's little things like that that can turn our children aside. Secondly, we want to always maintain the relationship. Up on the screen is this triangle. You know how triangles work? You, the adult child, the path taken. Sometimes the path that they take is just simply destructive. And there are times when parents can try to intervene between the child and the path that they're taking. And that's called an intervention. And you will need to have a professional counselor help you do that. There's a time to do that. There is. It's called intervention. But typically, there's not a lot of influence we can do between the adult child and the choices they've made. We, 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 we can't have much influence there. But what we can do is maintain our relationship with the child. And so, do something to improve your relationship. You know, do, do the emails. Take them to lunch. Initiate that. Uh, don't, don't beat up their friends. You know, respect their friends. Uh, don't make too many rules uh, so that they feel uncomfortable in your home. But, but maintain your relationship with that person, even though their behavior is deplorable to you. Maintain your relationship. But that also means to set and to keep boundaries. This is tough love, the concept of tough love. Uh, so, you know, folks, one day the parents, you know, you, you have to sometimes uh, make the decision to close the bank of mom and dad. That day comes? Yeah, I've been there. You say, enough, enough. <laughs> this is not happening anymore. You have the right to tell your child when they come in. No, you take your shoes off to the door. You don't use that kind of language in our house. No, you will not sleep with your boyfriend or your girlfriend in our home. These are our rules. You must, if you're going to be here, you can't be doing that stuff in our house. So, you don't bring your pot here, you know. <laughs> you set and keep boundaries. It's part of parenting. But maintain your relationship in spite of all that. Then, of course, pray. Pray, pray. Why? Because God loves them and he is not willing for any to perish. Any, any to perish, including your wayward child. Any. He is not willing for them to perish. God is sovereign. He is all-powerful. And I love this quote out of Matthew 3, that God can from these stones bring forth children of Abraham. So there is no child too far gone, too hard spiritually, that God cannot get through and soften and break. There is always hope for your wayward child. God has the power. He is sovereign. And he knows exactly how and when he's going to do that. But pray, pray, pray that God will do so. 
Pray that the child will come to their senses. You know, Luke 15, you have the prodigal son, right? He took his money. He went to Las Vegas. He spent it all, and now he's in the pig pen, and he's looking at the pigs, and he's wanting what they're eating. He's that low. And for a Jewish boy, that's really low. (laughs) And it says, he came to his senses. Pray that your wayward child would come to their senses, that God would meet them there in the pig trough and say, hey, there's another way. Look up. Look my way. Pray that that moment comes. And when that moment comes, point them to the person of Jesus. We want to look at their behaviors. We want to look at, well, come to church. It's not about coming to church. It's about Finding out who Jesus is because he is the Savior. The church didn't die for your sins. Jesus did. And so talk to them about Jesus, not so much about what they're doing right or wrong or about coming to church. It's so more deeper than that. It's about the person of Christ. And I know that's a hard point. Where do you stop talking about the weather and start talking to them about Christ? That's not an easy one. But it takes that relationship, spending time with them. And then in those moments where you can get to that deeper level. And so many times we avoid it. So these are my challenges to you. Parents who have children, grandparents, when will I become more diligent in training my child? Please do not give that up. That is your primary responsibility. And what is the one step you can do to start working on it today. Lord, thanks again for this challenge of this word. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from. We want it to be an ironclad promise. We want it to work every single time, and yet we recognize that it's a proverb, not a promise. And so help us in each of our stations of life to positively influence the children in our lives those that belong to us, those that don't belong to us, that we are good examples of Jesus in word and deed, that we are consistent, Lord, and that we don't sin against them, Lord. Keep us from harming our own children. Keep us from doing harm to those in our, in our circles, Lord, that we might see children who truly know your way of wisdom and knowledge and understanding. In Christ's name, be with these parents today. Amen.